Thank you for having me. This has been pretty incredible to see such a large WordCamp here in Philly, first ever WordCamp US. This is pretty amazing. Uh, so those of you who don't know me, my name is Andy Nason. I am one of the lead developers of WordPress, doing that for about five or six years now. Uh, I also separately, currently as my full-time job, work for a group called the US Digital Service. Uh, this is a talk only in my personal capacity. I am not a covert internet assassin. Thank you, Michael. Um, and I'll be talking about purely WordPress stuff. If you want to talk about government stuff, by all means, you can come find me later. Uh, so today, I'm going to be talking about advanced topics in WordPress development. For those of you who have seen me talk before, you might have recognized this title. Uh, this is my version of the TBA. Uh, in this particular case, one of the reasons why is because I'm able to kind of get an idea for what is happening in the community at a particular point and potentially bring it together uh, uh, for something that is uh, particularly pertinent for that time. Uh, so there are a number of things happening recently. And also earlier this week, the, some of the core committers got together in New York and talked about uh, a lot uh, about vision and project philosophies. So today, I would like to talk a little bit about how users must be able to trust the software that they use. Uh, we have all always had a situation, I'm sure, where you've tried out a new editor or a new tool. And at some point, you stop using that tool. And a lot of times when you stop using that tool, it's because something happened that you didn't expect. Usually, you lost your data. I don't know how many times that I've used an editor, lost my data, and nope, not using that editor anymore. You don't exactly want to like, keep using it at that point. This is a fairly important piece. You don't, like, you, your content is supposed to be sacred. And if the tools that you're using are just don't care about that, well, that doesn't really make it a very good editor. That's kind of the very first thing. Also, with WordPress, if WordPress breaks, you are probably all still here. But the vast majority of users, they're gone. They're completely gone. They don't care how it broke. They don't care why it broke. They might not know that they're using WordPress. They certainly don't know about PHP. They're just gone. We've lost them. So the, that user trust is really, really important to establish and to hold. So WordPress has done a lot of really interesting things over the last few years. So for example, with automatic updates. We're at this point, and I love being able to continue to update this number, we owe it to 25% of the internet to keep WordPress sites secure, as many of them as possible. So with automatic updates, we have to make sure that they work. We have to make sure that they're consistent. We have to make sure that they, that they don't break the person's site and they're only doing good as much as possible. This actually isn't true. It's actually 100%. Because it, at that scale, you're pretty much always hitting a WordPress site on your day-to-day. Uh, day -day. This is just the way it works. I think it's one out of every six people on the planet use Google every day. It's got to be pretty close to that for stumbling across a WordPress site as well. In practice, for automatic updates, the real-world chance of failure is about 99 out of a couple of million. Uh, that is a 99.996% success rate. It's pretty good. I think that the WordPress team would love to get it to perfect 100. But this is really important. We actually delayed shipping WordPress 2.7 by about a week, because we're only at about 91 or so. And we ended up going from about 91, 19 to 3 nines plus in a matter of a week with just some simple improvements, because we realized how important it was that if we were going to launch a major feature like this, and basically, in many ways, it was telling the community, don't worry, trust us. Uh, we got this. We're not going to break any sites. And I don't know if you read any comment threads in WP Tavern, but there were some concerns. Uh, this was a pretty important thing that we had to think about. Uh, another another uh, situation where this has happened is with autosaves. So autosaves have been in WordPress for quite some time. Uh, but in WordPress 3.6, we focused a lot of our time on trying to make autosaves even better making it so your content really cannot be lost. It's going to be somewhere. If your computer suddenly just boom shuts down, it's still somewhere potentially. So essentially, we're trying to make sure that WordPress is trying to protect your content from cats on a keyboard or East, East Quarter joke, anyone? No, maybe? Amtrak Wi-Fi? Have you ever noticed, by the way, that it's written in PHP? Have you ever noticed that? Anyway, OK, it is, fun fact. Um, and then it comes to another piece, which is backwards compatibility. And this has come up a lot lately. And especially one of the interesting things where I find this come up is some recent conversations around Clipso, which is the, 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 new, uh, the new pretty amazing dashboard from WordPress.com, and how by rewriting pretty much from scratch, they're able to focus on a lot of uh, really interesting, uh, really, really awesome improvements because they weren't hindered. Uh, and I think this is interesting because it leaves, it opens up a good question as to why is WordPress backwards compatible? 
Uh, there are a number of reasons for this. One is we don't want to be burdening users. We don't want users to ever experience pain when they don't necessarily need to. Because uh, quite frankly, it's probably going to be less painful if we handle this edge case than if we pass it off to potentially millions of people or tens of thousands of developers or whatever it may be. Uh, ultimately, I hope that we're a little better, better at debugging our own tools. And this is one of these problems over and over again where you end up having, uh, uh, in many cases, you have libraries that will break something uh, and they'll say, but, but it's easier for us to maintain. I'm like, OK, how hard was it to maintain? Because now you have just caused X number of people to upgrade all your stuff. I'm not saying that everything in the world should be perfectly backwards compatible. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I am saying that backwards compatibility is one of the most important drivers of WordPress growth. It works everywhere, pretty much everywhere. So for example, PHP 7 just released yesterday. Uh, many extensions are not yet updated. But the extensions that WordPress needs, which is one, it works. So WordPress can already or tomorrow work on PHP 7, just as an example. Uh, or yesterday, I guess. Uh, but this kind of back to compatibility is actually a huge driver of growth. Why? Because it doesn't prevent people from upgrading. Many users, they have no idea what all of these things mean. They don't know what MySQL is. They don't know what PHP is. They, ha they find a plugin that answers their call, and if it works, great. If it doesn't, oops, and that's about as far as they will get. Um, all they really want to really focus on doing is they want to be able to publish on the internet. WordPress lets them do that. If WordPress at any point becomes too complex for a user to publish on the internet, they're probably going to stop using WordPress. So in the case of backwards compatibility, we have to be really careful because we want to really try and build smarter. Uh, so for example, um, backwards compatibility, it's kind of interesting. Helen mentioned this earlier, where it's kind of the two-way street. It's not just uh, making it so previous stuff breaks, but also there's the forwards aspect, the forwards looking aspect of you want to make sure that you're not kind of like putting your feet in cement uh, later on. So maybe we might not make another change for two more years, but we want to make sure we're at least going in the right general direction to avoid that. Uh, of course, in WordPress, there are a lot of case studies for this, and I had quite a bit of fun researching them for the last few weeks. Um, there, this comment. Uh, if you know WordPress well, you will know that this is probably a bit of a lie. Um, this comment in an exact form appears in the code base like five times. Uh, some of them date back to like very early days uh, of WordPress. Um, but at the same time, well, it hasn't been removed yet in many cases because it hasn't been a burden. Because it, if it is a burden for future development, it probably would get stricken. But there's no real reason. It's sitting there. It's harmless. It's not causing any of the bugs. It has no other side effects. Maybe it could just stay there. Maybe it's a little bit of extra technical debt that we're taking on, for sure. WordPress is not short of that. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and also, we try and be pragmatic. And we have said before that WordPress never breaks any changes. That's a lie. Totally break things all of the time. The difference is that we're very careful about it. And usually, it happens after a bit of a delay. Uh, good example of this is that uh, I'm going to talk about media in a little bit. And the current, the current media library, pretty great. Old media library still kind of around. Doesn't have all of that new functionality still. We're not we're deliberately bringing back stuff into that old interface. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is we're just trying to be as much as possible just uh, careful and says that if we're going to break this thing, let's at least like not have it fatal error and perhaps trying to figure out what is the most graceful way for this to, to, to fall back. So this is a help screen, which is not all that useful as a help screen. Um, going back to WordPress 3.2 or so. Uh, and what we ended up doing is we changed it. Now, this was, this, whole, this was just like one giant thing of text that was filterable in the admin. Not very effective to work with. We changed it to this other thing. It had a sidebar and a footer and, and a, bunch of different, uh, a bunch of different tabs. And what we ended up doing is we were able to still handle this in a nice, easy, backwards compatible way. We still ran the old filter. If anyone and added any more help to it, we just appended it to the bottom in a new tab. Additional information. That way, anything that a plugin was still doing was not being lost into the ether. It was still there in some way. Was it perfect? No. If we wanted to handle this in a backwards compatible way, we wouldn't have launched it. We would have left it as is. It's not always what it means. We have other random things in core, like setting super globals, which is not really something you should do. But some plugin was looking for this value and activating a plugin. And so this is a thing that's been existing in WordPress core for like five years. It's pretty harmless. 
because, well, it's there, it does this thing, but it otherwise doesn't really cause any side effects or any other problems. A uh, few releases ago, Press This was rewritten. Really, really fantastic effort to improve the bookmarklet. Um, and from scratch, completely from scratch. And this happens sometimes with WordPress. For the most part, a lot of features are not rewritten from scratch. Um, and yet, it all still worked with all the other things it integrated with. It had a number of URL arguments that could be passed in. It had all the old bookmarklets and the new bookmarklets, and it just worked. Uh, and that's kind of a nice, graceful way to handle this. You can go back even further than that to WordPress 3.0, which merged in multi-site, which was originally WordPress Mu. Uh, if you've been around since 2009, 2010. Uh, actually, this is, this is funny. Um, uh, Matt Mullenweg uh, announced that WordPress Mu was being merged in to WordPress 3.0 on stage at WordCamp San Francisco 2009. I was not yet uh, involved in the WordPress community, um, but all of the other lead developers were, and they didn't hear about it either. <laughs> and so this is one of these things where it's like, we have this thing that we want to do, now we have to go about doing it. That's also not a bad way to think about software in many cases. The programming is kind of like a, it's, it's the means to the end, right? Like the goal was, Stop maintaining this separate fork that was 99% duplicative and 1% could be better. Uh, and instead, try and make it so we could perhaps improve uh, the whole ecosystem and being able to bring this functionality to WordPress. So uh, I was involved for this cycle, and we spent months trying to figure out all the different things that we had to merge in and bring in together. Um, and in this particular case, we ended up turning off a lot of stuff. This is like random things like global terms and uh, Oh god, uh, global categories, which is not global terms, even though it sounds like it's the same thing. And there's like a bunch of really random stuff that we just like slowly shut off. And like by the time you got up there, they were gone. So it was a bit of an upgrade path, but for the most part, it didn't affect a lot of people. And even the ones that it did, it, it failed fairly gracefully. All new installs didn't have all this extra cuff. All the old installs still did. So a lot of times we're making these case by case decisions. Sometimes it's a little harder to handle. Sometimes we have. Uh, little comments like this. This is actually in WordPress right now, um, where like there's this random thing that we needed to handle, probably going back like to 2005, 2006. But it's easier to handle it than to just break the site entirely. This ends up happening a few times. Uh, this is also probably my favorite comment in WordPress. Um, and then what follows is like a thing that is not really decipherable. So maybe not the best example. Uh, in some other cases where this compatibility is a thing is that when WordPress 3.2 came out and the PHP minimum requirement bumped to 5.2, we realized, great, we can use JSON now. The problem is a very, very, very small percentage of sites did not have JSON enabled. I am not entirely sure how these servers functioned, but they did. The problem is that 0.012% of sites is still like in the tens of thousands of sites. They didn't do anything wrong. So there's now a library in core, you can find it if you try, that parses JSON in PHP for these sites. Never gets loaded otherwise, it just sits there. Uh, but it's just one, it took us like a day to like find the library, test it out, write the little compact code, put a shim in, it's done. And that was like not a lot of time and it was totally worth it because then we never need to worry about this problem again. And now suddenly, we are portable with even more servers. We don't need to worry about this. There's going to be no more support. We've cut down the amount of support that we have to deal with. Uh, and plugins, of course, can go ahead and use JSON without really being worried about, like, do I need to fall back for this? Because that, be kind of, that would be kind of lame. Who's been around in WordPress since plugins didn't exist? Number of hands. So there's this really great file called myhacks.php. It used to sit in the root. Uh, and what would happen is uh, it would just be included if it existed. And then eventually it ended up getting shut off. Uh, there was the option, in, there was a checkbox in the UI until like five years ago to turn on legacy MyHacks PHP support, which no idea what that means. Uh, so that's gone. But yet, if the option is still set and the file is still there, it still pulls it in. There's actually code right now in WordPress that will pull this file in. You're like, well, that's kind of a waste. OK, well, right now it's one line of code and basically one CPU cycle because it's looking up a value in cache before continuing. So it's not really causing a whole lot of problems here. And if you look at the, the startup for WordPress, there are probably a lot of other larger things that you can target to make it faster. This is probably not it. But 
someone from Automatic uh, said, you know what, I want to clean this up, I want to remove this. I said, okay, great. Uh, question, how much do you think it's used? I was like, I have no idea. So he ended up uh, looking to see how many vault press sites, this is a few years ago, had it installed. And he only found it on six of them, but that's still six. But my favorite thing about this is that it included both co-founders of WordPress. Which, in fairness, they have indeed been using WordPress for quite a while, so it's potentially understandable. So rather than breaking it, it's just still there. Uh, I don't know what's in these files, but it's still there. It doesn't really cause any harm. It still sits in core. Uh, another thing that I worked on in particular was uh, WP Theme. This was in WordPress 3.4. It was a complete replacement of this m gigantic, ridiculous, multidimensional associative array of theme data which it usually needed on average like half a percent of the data on any page load. So obviously, of course, we, loaded, we calculated and loaded the whole thing. Um, it was so big that on WordPress.com it couldn't fit into a cache bucket. Uh, so they had to chunk it up. It wouldn't fit in a memcache. Uh, and so we ended up doing a complete replacement of this. And it was way more performant. It was orders of magnitude faster. It added a support for a dozen new features, including things like interna uh, internationalized uh, theme headers. The customizer came in this release. Custom headers and backgrounds all happened in this case. And there were no reports of breakage, which is funny because we were passing around to filters and to functions and everything else this theme object, which was array. And then suddenly it was an object, and nothing broke. And the reason why nothing broke is because everything became a magical PHP object, which is not to be confused with the rest of all the objects in PHP. Uh, so this is thing called array object. If you haven't heard of it before, it's pretty cool. Uh, this is just an example of, of one of the interfaces it implements. We can do something like this where, um, uh, where, and that's actually supposed to be offset get. Typo in my slide, first problem. Um, <laughs> and you can go ahead and actually, this is an array, right? Like we're calling it as if it's an array, but it's not. Uh, and it spits out hello world. This is just something that PHP can automatically do. So now suddenly we can take the return value of when the theme was an array, and then when the theme is an object with decorated methods, and then also when the object gets cast to an array because some other area of WordPress is doing this, and we're able to kind of like standardize all of this in one go pretty easily. Uh, there's also this thing called magic methods in PHP, so you might have seen a magic getter before. Uh, where this is for properties in this case, so world is a property doesn't exist, yet we can go ahead and call this. So this took, this entire effort was one person, six days, uh, about 12,000 lines of WordPress were rewritten, and nothing broke in the end. This whole API, which it was not an API to begin with, let's face it, uh, was upgraded into a real one, Nothing broke. The whole thing made it uh, a lot easier for things like the customizer and media and a lot of things to be written in the, in the ensuing years. Uh, and it was just a really nice way to be able to uh, uh, ship a, a new thing into WordPress. Um, so in this case, we're able to upgrade an entire API in place. We're able to enable the user-facing features. We made sites faster. And these are a bit in order of what preference is, right? We were also able to empower developers to build new things, standardized all the craziness under the hood, and didn't break anything. Not bad for six days of work. Uh, in WordPress 3.5, there was media. Now, media, you've heard this a few times this weekend, uh, taking a PHP interface and completely replacing it with a JavaScript interface. There have been a few talks about this. REST API, Calypso, a lot of things here. Now, when we tackled this, we didn't really set out to break plugins, uh, obviously. Uh, that is actually never our intention, um, at least not on purpose. Uh, but so what we ended up doing is that we realized that because of the ecosystem, because of uh, a, a desire to kind of handle this gracefully, a lot of things still went through, back through PHP, because in many cases it had to, for example, go into the database, whatever it might be. So when you like send a link to the editor or you upload a post, of course it gets processed by PHP before it gets sent there. And we're able to still do things like fire filters off when we needed to. And so every, any plugin that was doing anything crazy on these like random send to editor, media, whatever hooks, that there were a lot of plugins in the library doing a lot of, uh, in the directory doing a lot of these things, we were able to handle this completely transparently without any problems, even though we were completely gutting the interface, left it for dead, and build a new one in Backbone. 
There were some things like attachment fields to edit and attachment fields to save that ended up creating these giant arrays of HTML that would print out uh, your fields. Uh, so the new library automatically handled this by default. It was like, oh, you registered some fields previously. Well, I guess I need to render these in JavaScript instead and then save them with an AJAX call. Simple, effective, took a little bit of time on our end and took absolutely no time on a plugin author's end. And they were able to then suddenly use the new functionality of media without any problem. So this kind of like fully transparent to the user and to the developer is really important. Uh, another example is, uh, you, you guys remember this? Good old days. Uh, this is the old media library from, this is uh, 2.5 to 3.4, give or take. Uh, and you can see the tabs at the top, from computer, from URL, media library. And these were set in PHP. Uh, this is a filter called media upload tab. Still exists today. You can still use it if you wanted to. But we still kept it in WordPress. We got rid of the labels because they weren't useful. And we got rid of everything when we were done. So we ended up with an empty array. Unless a plugin added something. So if a plugin wanted to, a plugin can today, I'm not saying I recommend this, but a plugin can right now add a bunch of tabs. Uh, and then suddenly, this is the new media library, and they'll show up. That's it. And then the best thing is that they will actually, if you go to one of those tabs, it will render the original tab in an iframe, firing the old PHP hooks, and give you back your old media UI. Completely seamless, fully integrated, new interface, new technology stack, JavaScript, not PHP. Didn't affect the user at all, didn't break the plugins at all, and from start to finish, we were done in two days to that entire piece. So this, of course, made it so when you upgraded to 3.5, you didn't need to really worry about all this stuff. Uh, it was pretty great. There were a number of smaller edge cases, things we didn't try to, that we didn't realize we were breaking, of course. There are a lot of situations that we're considering how can we meet all these requirements in a sane way, in a pragmatic way, and when we can't, when can we just kind of like shove it off to the side and don't worry about it anymore, but make sure that the site doesn't break in the process. Vastly improved user experience. Place the whole PHP-driven th PHP thing with the JavaScript thing. The media handling was way better. Developers had more tools to do things, and we didn't need to break anything. So hypothetically, conceivably, we could migrate the WordPress dashboard to JavaScript and still actually keep a lot of things compatible, hypothetically. Maybe. Uh, and then I'll close with talking about how a lot of the times, especially when dealing with these kinds of things, documenting the decision is, of course, really important. So there's a lot of places in this case in WordPress where we document it on the handbook or what was the codex, in the code, of course, sometimes in a commit message. Um, but not everything really belongs just purely in documentation. Because in a project that is as large as WordPress, you're going to have situations where three or four years later, you, and I don't mean someone else, I mean you, will come by and have a completely different answer to the same question, and you will be wrong. Because you, three or four years ago, was smarter. This happens to me a lot. Uh, like, wow, that's a really smart comment. You scroll up, oh, I wrote it, yes. Right? And so that can be interesting. How do you actually document these things? Uh, WordPress, in many cases, tries as much as possible to codify these design decisions in its testing framework. Uh, so for example, four or five years from now, Someone decides, I'm going to go ahead and change this thing. And it was written in this way eight, nine years ago. And there was someone proposed, like, can we change it? And the answer was, like, no, and here's why. And I did a lot of research. In a lot of cases, the ticket will just then be closed. This happens in all software. They're like, nope, not a good idea. The ticket will be closed. What if we enforced that as part of our unit test? A failing unit test could just trigger immediate review. It could say, like, well, there, ticket over here. You're about to break it. Actually, you just did. Right? There are different ways to approach this. So <laughs> one of my favorite ones is that, I don't know if you ever noticed this, but if you're looking at a post object or a common object, uh, these are strings, not integers. Um, and if for some reason you, we change these to integers, which we've tried to do at least twice, and every single time we'd get a ton of bug reports saying like, hey, by the way, you broke this thing because I was doing a strict comparison here and here and whatever, and then by the way, WordPress broke over here and you know, Drupal broke over here, and a lot of things went wrong, right? So we have a unit test that just en enforces that. It's simple. This is not hard, but it's a thing that we need to consider. Um, 
If you saw Gary Pendergast talk this morning about the what would uh, usually called Trojan emoji now, thank you, Brian Krogsgaard, for coining that one, um, where the, we have a situation where there's actually a type of serialized class uh, that cannot be unserialized in WordPress, uh, cannot be serialized in WordPress. Like it, it, it will break. If this ever got added into core, like this special kind of serialized class got added to support foreign core, we would be immediately committing to WordPress core a, uh, a remote code execution vulnerability. That's not good, so there's unit test for that. Uh, there's also little comments like this, like double serializations require backup compatibility, which is true. Also, the world will end, see this security release. Uh, this is sitting in WordPress right now. Um, and then finally, uh, more recently, there was this HTML uh, embed, WordPress O embed, this is a new feature in WordPress 4.4, I'm sure you'll hear about it tomorrow. Uh, and this is this like giant, you all see this, you go to YouTube, like copy and paste the embed code, paste it in, things like that. Well, there was a slight problem where we have this code in this JavaScript file that then got inlined, and WordPress, in its infinite wisdom on older sites, would, would change it. So you see the change there, the ampersands change to uh, hex. So that's not good. Um, so now we have nested if statements instead. <laughs> We removed all of the ampersands out of this file, which is not exactly the most effective way to write JavaScript. So how do you enforce such a decision like this? How do you prevent someone else or yourself a few years later being like, wow, we should probably remove all these nested ifs. And someone forgot that there was a thing called and. Um, so there's this comment at the top of the file as of yesterday. Uh, this file cannot have ampersands in it. This is to ensure it can be embedded in older versions of WordPress. See this commit. Well, that's good. But this is a pretty bad thing, and I don't usually read the comments at the top of a file, and I'm not going to comment every single situation where there could be an if statement that could be optimized. So we wrote a unit test. Pretty simple. It checks to make sure there's no ampersands in the file. Simple, easy, codified, cannot break this. Except for the fact that this file is also uglified. Uglified.js, it runs all sorts of compression and optimization algorithms. So like you can turn off optimization of conditionals. The problem, of course, is that there is no setting in Uglify, I'm really glad for this, that says do not use ampersands, because that would be kind of weird. But we cannot use ampersands. So we now need to test the compressed JavaScript, and I'm just going to show you this briefly. I don't think you'll be able to see it too well. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a nasty regex right there. Um, this is now in our unit tests. It's not in WordPress, it's OK. Um, and in this case, what it's doing is it's actually like very much carefully checking to make sure that this minified file is not, does not have an ampersand in it no matter what. So Travis CI will pick this up and it'll flag it and it'll say like, whoa, pause, you just broke everything. And by everything, I mean a very random HTML embed feature that not a whole lot of people use because it's only on older versions of WordPress, blah, blah, blah. Um, but that's not all. In addition to the unit test, we wrote four paragraphs explaining <laughs> exactly what's going on. Uh, and if you want to take a look, it's 35762. That was the chain set that added all this code. Um, I'm not going to leave this up here for you to read it. Um, so that is codifying your decision, putting it directly into there. Um, so going back to philosophies, which I mentioned earlier, uh, we have a number of these core development philosophies available on WordPress.org. They were written many years ago before I got involved in the project. They're really great. I think that they, they personally have affected me a lot in how I think that products should be designed. Um, there's a lot of these. You've heard of a lot of these like decisions on options and working well out of the box and things of that nature. Um, but backwards compatibility is actually missing out of this. It's not there. Um, and the reason why I think it's not there personally is because I think that it's only the means to an end. Uh, I think that the end goal is that we should make it so your users can actually trust your software. So if we want to break things, that's OK. The philosophy is not never break something. The philosophy is make sure your users can trust your software. Um, in reality, that the, the ability to establish and then maintain that trust, it's essentially a contractual relationship with users and developers. We don't get a whole lot out of it if we do it well. But if we don't do it well, we're not really going to have that user or developer for that much longer. Uh, so I think in this case, it's really just very critical, as much as possible, to respect the trust that user places with your software and to really consider all the different things that you can possibly do to make it so that is OK. Thank you very much. I have, I think, about six or seven minutes for questions if you want to come up to the mic up in the aisle. All right, see you later.
No, really. Anything? Wow. It's my 47th WordCamp. I've never had no questions. Uh, when it comes to PHP versions, you know, I think, I think you're totally right in the decision with 5.2. Um, but obviously, at some point, you know, we have to make that decision. So yep. I'm wondering, you know, if you have an idea in your mind, and more specifically, like, are you interested in coming up with a pattern, like a rolling pattern after X number of years, you know, we deprecate support for this version? So the, the problem with that, is, with the idea of a rolling pattern, is that PHP just recently changed its own uh, support, supported versions. Uh, so particularly with 7 and with each of the major versions, there's a lot of flux there. We're now 5.4 is now end of life, and then a year each, everything will start going away. I think PHP 5. Point, or PHP, 5, uh, PHP 7 is end of life in like 2018. Did I get that about right? Um, I don't think that our minimum requirement will be 7 by 2018. Just drawing that out there. Um, so uh, I think a lot of this is maybe wait and see to see how the whole ecosystem reacts. Um, but I'm sure that Matt will talk about this tomorrow not saying ask him about it, but I, I know I know they'll probably end up talking about how we spent the last year trying to engage with hosts. Uh, and Dion Hulse in particular worked a lot on this um, to try and understand a little bit how how they can upgrade more. Um, there's a number of really cool success stories there as well. Um, so uh, I don't know exactly. Um, I would like to stop supporting 5.2, but at the same time, there's a few million websites that are still running 5.2. Personally, I would I care more about the older versions of WordPress than I do about the older versions of PHP. And even on 4.3, uh, the latest version for the moment for WordPress, uh, something like, I want to say, like 6 or 7% of sites are running 5.2 still. So that's, I mean, that's a few million sites right there. Um, and we wouldn't want to just break it just so we could like, start using namespaces, as cool as they are. Um, I'm curious, when you talk about uh, replacing a really big feature like the media library or something like that, and you're trying to maintain backward compatibility, what's the process? Do you just start out by building, like, this is what we think would be the coolest thing, and then going backward and figuring out where the backward compatibility needs to fit in? Or do you start with, like, these are the things that we need to maintain, and then going forward? What does that process look like? So uh, in my experience, it has usually been the first one. It is like, we want to build this thing. We do not want to be constricted in what we're building. And then let's figure out where we might need to make some adjustments. Um, there have also been some times when we've slipped fatal errors into core on purpose for like a few betas or RCs just to see if anyone would know, see if anyone was using that particular feature, um, see how many reports we might get, maybe to like let them know maybe stop using this thing. We're not going to leave it there, of course, but there are a lot of we might accidentally. That's why we have unit tests for this stuff. Um, and so there are little things like that that we try and maybe. Uh, um, uh, that we try and watch, but in media's case in particular, this really was like we're going to build a thing, and then we're going to like sh like shim in anything that we possibly can. And this happened with I I added I only talked about like two things like post parenting menu order when you're rearranging galleries. We did a lot of random little stuff that was able to in many cases continue to support a lot of the crazy plugins that were in the media landscape, like uh, some of the gallery plugins and things like that. Uh, but we realized that it can be a little easier to band-aid them. That said, it can be helpful to fully size up what you feel like you might need to support. Um, but two problems with that. One, it might not be possible to do so. And two, if you do that, you might really constrain yourself from being able to think about what the best product is, which I think is a lot more important than how it's the best way to technically implement it. Any other questions? Wow. All right, thank you very much.